Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden and today I am here with another very exciting collab video. Um, thank you guys so much for the response for uh, the last one we did which is when me and a bunch of other booktubers all read some of the finalists and or runners-up um, of the Goodreads Choice Awards for the last 10 years. And um, We all picked a category and we read uh, one for every year. Um, some people had to do multiple for series so it, we, we all suffered for that content, but thankfully you guys enjoyed it. Um, I will link that playlist of all of those videos down below, and we are back with another one. Um, the theme this time is Did Booktube Fool Us? This is going up on April Fool's Day, and so we thought it would be a really fun idea to uh, do kind of a themed video for that. So basically we're all doing a vlog or a video on um, one or more hyped books <laughs> that are very well loved on booktube or on the bookish internet and that we are kind of worried like we're kind of suspecting that we won't like but we might be pleasantly surprised um so i will link all of the booktubers and the playlist of all of these videos down below uh we have a lot of returning faces from last time as well as a few new people please be sure to check out everyone else's videos i'm very excited to see everyone's vlogs and see how we all like see how all of our experience was um so my plan for this one well, like, it's weird to say, like, my plan for this one because I'm actually filming this intro at the end of the video, so I already know everything that happened, but the plan um, was I had a couple of different options. Um, I have The Lies of Loch Lamora by Scott Lynch, which is a very popular, very highly rated um, adult fantasy series. This is the first book. It is set in a kind of Italian-esque setting, um, and I know it's like a heist story. There's supposed to be a great uh, friendship between two male characters. I've heard like the world building and the story is just very interesting. Um, so the plan is to get to this one and or the two remaining books that I have in the Infernal Devices trilogy by Cassandra Clare. Um, so I read the first book which is Clockwork Angel a couple of years ago and I just never continued. Um, and this whole series, like Cassandra Clare as an author in general is very hyped, but this trilogy specifically I feel like it's kind of extra hyped. Like I feel like this is like known as one of her best series, if not her best. And we're gonna see <laughs> if I agree when I finish it. Um, I, I had the very middling feelings about the first book. I gave it three stars. It was just very fine for me. Um, but maybe these last two books will turn it around. Um, I have heard from people that like it's one of their favorite series endings of all time. Uh, and that it's like just really really well done and very like satisfying. So I have book two which is Clockwork Prince. I keep like looking at the Cassandra Clare part <laughs> rather than like the giant writing that is the title. Um, and then book three which is the final one and that is Clockwork Princess. So uh, the plan <laughs> is to get to at least like at least The Lies of Loch Lamora or the Cassandra Clare books. Ideally I would get to all of these, <laughs> uh, but we'll see what happens. Um, as I said, I already know what happens. You'll see. <laughs> You'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, if there is anything else I forgot to mention, I will put that in the description. Um, I will also put content warnings for the books in the description too. So let's get into it and see if booktube fooled me. Hello everybody, I am here with my first reading update. Uh, so as you will have seen in the introduction, the plan was to read um, like a couple different books for this vlog and it's a good thing I planned that way, that I had a backup because I just DNF'd one of my picks. Um, yeah, so the one I DNF'd is The Lies of Locke Lamora by Scott Lynch. This is the first book in the Gentleman Bastard series. I DNF'd this at like 68 pages and there's there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, so for one thing, I find it incredibly frustrating that so many fantasy authors will do like well, they'll, they'll do like a heist story, like a heist plot line, but they just throw you into that and expect you to care without doing like absolutely any character work before that. And it's like I can enjoy a heist story, but like like with any plot, I feel like you have to do a good job of making us care about who the plot is happening to in order for it to work successfully. Um, like I'm thinking of the Clockwork Boys series that I just finished by T. Kingfisher. Um, that is another adult fantasy that has a big like heist element. That's actually the main plot of the books. Um, and there's a lot of character work like before you get there. Like there are still things happening. It's not like nothing happens um, at the beginning part of the story, but like the first kind of like novella length book in that duology uh, is essentially like the setup. Like you're getting to know the characters, they're getting to the city where they're going to do the heist, and then the second book is a lot more about the heist. And so by that point it's really interesting because you care about the people involved in the heist. And this book didn't do that. And then also like so Foundryside, for example, by Robert Jackson Bennett. That is another adult fantasy that has a big heist element. And that one I think 
it kind of does something similar to Scott Lynch where it's like all plot and heist stuff at the beginning but I feel like the thing that kept me going with that one is that even though we didn't get a lot of character work at the beginning we did later but we didn't get a lot at the beginning is that the magic system was so fascinating and interesting that that kind of kept me engaged in those like plot parts um, and like the heist element and then when I got more attached to the characters then I was even more invested. This book did not have that so it was just, it was such a slog, like just those 68 pages were excruciating, especially like this has such a long prologue that is so boring and so pointless. Like it just seems like so many things in this book, like so many scenes, um, like the fact that we had that long ass prologue for no reason. Like there's so many things about the construction of this book that seem just set up so that Scott Lynch can like have people tell Locke how like interesting and special he is. That's something you need to show us in the story and with the characterization. Like I, I find it very annoying when it feels, when I feel like authors are trying to force you to feel a certain way about a character without actually doing any of the work for it. And that was the feeling I got here. I also really, really didn't like the writing style. It feels very smug to me, um, like very self-satisfied and very cluttered. Like it's not it's not like flowery but it's just like everything is just a little too much like why can't we use some of these pages for actually like making us care about the characters not just describing settings for no reason when when we don't actually need information like spending so much time on things that don't matter and then skipping over things that do and then like i said i also feel like i guess smug is kind of a weird word to use for it but that really is the best way i can describe it it just feels it feels like Scott Lynch is like patting himself on the back like every sentence you know um it, it's just written in a very specific kind of like like self self-congratulating you know like fantasy also as a result of the other things I've talked about I just found this incredibly boring and dull I <laughs> I read the prologue and the first chapter and that's it that's another thing is like the chapters are way too long there are at least little sections like section breaks in it but yeah so I was already having a horrible time with this so I think those things enough by themselves were were like making me would have been enough to make me want to DNF this um, especially because like with writing so many of my issues come back to the writing and the way Scott Lynch writes and like does his characters and everything that is something that is almost certainly not going to improve as the book goes on you know it's not like a oh I don't like this plot line but maybe it'll get resolved and then I'll like the story more so that was there was like already a lot of strikes against this book for me but also there was throughout just kind of sprinkled in uh the kind of like misogyny as garnish that I am growing to absolutely despise in fantasy um and this is not just a Scott Lynch problem and it's not just a male fantasy author problem Robin Hobb does this all the time too and I'm just I'm just tired of things like misogyny and like other kind of isms being just like thrown out there just like I said sprinkled like garnish um as world building or like as a shortcut to like look at how gritty my book is kind of thing and I mean one of the earliest indications of that is the word the use of c-u-n-t as like a verb well like at, at all but um describing themselves as going out and like that was the word they used for like finding like prostitutes to sleep with and it, it was just like a random one-off character and I don't think we're supposed to like them particularly so it's not that I thought we were like it's not that I thought the author was trying to tell us this is okay which I know that's also a cultural thing like I know in, in Australia and in other countries that um that is not as taboo but Scott Lynch is American <laughs> like he knows the cultural context for that word he knows the what's behind it he knows the kind of situations it's used in and so him using it is a very deliberate choice and so that was that was another thing that I wasn't liking but here's here's the thing that I say sometimes about these books is if I were liking the other things in this book even though that still would have bothered me and I would have talked about it as an issue with the book um, and also what that signifies in the story but if I was enjoying the characters if I was enjoying the writing if I thought the setting was done well like all of these other things then I could overlook it but because I didn't have those other things to hold on to it was a lot harder to just like you know move on um, so that was another thing and 
after reading all of these things, I was really wanting to DNF it, but I was feeling kind of bad because, you know, it's for a project and I don't DNF super often, so I would, I felt kind of like, well, I'm not giving it like a full, a full chance, you know, and I was actually talking to, um, my name is Marinez about it and we, we were discussing this book and we kind of started out joking and it ended up not being a joke. Like she said something about, um, like the number of female characters because like there has been no women in this book at this point, which I would rather have than writing women badly, but the problem is that there is still the attitudes around women that you have to like wade through even though there's no actual women in this book at this point. Um, so anyway, we were talking about that and Mari said something about like, you know, waiting until a female character shows up or something and I was like, oh yeah, like I should, like that should be my point when I reevaluate and decide if I want a DNF is like if a woman shows up and speaks. Um, and we were kind of joking, but then I was like, actually, that is a good idea. I think I'm going to do that. So we meet the first, like, female character, and she is named, so that's great. And she does speak, even though she is, like, getting all horny about Locke, um, which is annoying. But also, there's this line that is, I quote, Throwing blondes at Locke Lamora was not unlike throwing lettuce at sharks. Like, ugh gross. Um, yeah, so that is also in the category of if I loved everything else about this book, I still would have hated that line, but I could have moved past it. But this just seems indicative to me of the rest of the book. Um, and as I was saying, I am just really tired of misogyny as world-building garnish uh, for fantasy. I think we can do better. I know that this book is, like, not brand new or anything. Um, it came out 2006. Uh, we still knew better, I think, in 2006. So yeah, I, I feel like I always have to over explain myself with stuff like this. Now, if my only reason for DNFing was the misogyny in this book, I think that would be valid and that would be fair. Um, but I also want to reiterate that that's not my only reason. And I also, it's not just like offensive, I think it's also really lazy world building. Anyway, I've been talking about this book for way too long considering I didn't even finish it. I am so excited to unhaul this. So yeah. But on the more positive side, I did get Halfway Through Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare. This is the second book in the Infernal Devices trilogy, and I'm like exactly halfway just about. Uh, this also has really long chapters, which is kind of annoying, but uh, yeah, so I am at least liking this more than The Lies of Locke Lamora, but I am finding myself a lot more frustrated with this one than I am with the first book. Uh, like, I, I thought the first book was fine. It was, like, very middling for me. It was, like, a three-star, like, I was really underwhelmed by it, but it wasn't, like, I didn't hate it. This one, there are parts that I am actually hating. Like, I find Will Herondale such an irritating character. Uh, I know people love him, and I have loved character types like him, but I can't stand him. Like, he just, this book, and I said this about the first one too, it just feels like it's trying too hard. He just feels like a parody of himself. And so it is like bewildering to me why Tessa would, would be like so caught up on Will and like just the way he treats her and like the absolute ridiculousness of the thing that happened at the end of the first book that like creates the conflict between them in this book. It just seems so transparent and so obvious. I do want to say that I think Cassandra Clare is pretty good at side characters. Um, like, I'm actually more invested in some of the side characters and side relationships, which in a way is, like, not always a great thing if, if your protagonists aren't as interesting, but, um, yeah, like, I, I find, like, Charlotte an interesting character. I also really love Jessamine. Like, she's a horrible person, but her whole thing is kind of like, I hate it here. And I'm like, girl, same. So I feel like we have that connection. This is exactly why I loved Zoya in the Grisha trilogy, which I also did not like at all, uh, because Zoya hated Alina, and I felt a kinship with her. Um, so that's that's where I'm at with Jessamine. Is like she's interesting at least, even though she is very unpleasant. I just really like Jem. I like him so much more. I do think he's not as well developed as I think he needs to be, considering what an important like role he's playing. Uh, in the story. And I also just, I, it's supposed to be this really dramatic and intense love triangle, right? Uh, because, you know, Tessa is torn between her feelings for both of these guys and they are also bonded parabatai. So they are 
very very close kind of like blood brothers almost so it's supposed to be like an interesting and compelling conflict because they all care about each other and like how are they going to resolve these feelings kind of thing but i don't feel like that's working for me not only because i find will obnoxious and over the top but also because like i just don't think the characterization is done well enough for the three leads to justify this kind of drama like Tessa is like likable enough but she's fairly bland and then even Jem like I was saying I I like him more than a lot of the other characters we're supposed to like but he still feels pretty underdeveloped and I just I just don't think there's enough character work to back up this really intense I don't know like relationship or conflict um also just as an example of how like ridiculous and like over dramatic and like not in a fun way like not in a way that feels like deliberate it feels like this is like unintended cheesiness so will's whole like brooding bad boy thing where he's like no my love is a curse i can't do this and i guess this is like minor spoiler if you haven't read these books but um we find out finally at the beginning of the second book that like <laughs> no literally like a creature told him like i'm going to curse you and everyone you love <laughs> like if you love someone they die and it just seems like so ridiculous to me like this could have been like a really interesting character conflict but it's like so cheesy that it just falls flat and then another thing that i find very frustrating about this series and i guess this is a good opportunity to recommend a read-alike series for this one because i guess that's kind of how i'm doing this video i i guess i don't know um but i absolutely loved the dark days club series by allison goodman which i think has in some ways a pretty similar premise and even some of the character types like not in a way that feels derivative in either direction or that something is like too tropey because i think that's a ridiculous complaint um so i'm not saying that but I feel like there are some similar elements in that series that I just think are done so much better, like in terms of the character work and the the romance and um, another big thing is the world building and like the writing and all of that. And something that I find so <laughs> baffling and annoying about The Infernal Devices is like it's set in a historical time period, but Cassandra Clare spends all her time writing her way around the historical parts to the point where I'm like, why did you even set it in this time period? Like, is it just, it kind of feels like it was just for the aesthetic because like one of the things I think that can make historical fiction and historical fantasy enjoyable, especially when you're talking about character relationships, is like having these different sets of cultural norms and rules and like having to work around those. You know, like that's why you can have this really wonderful romantic tension between characters because like they're not even supposed to be alone together you know or they're not even supposed to like touch hands if they're not dancing that kind of thing and in in these books it's like oh yeah the shadow hunters don't do any of that it's like they use their first names and it's fine they can like young men and young women can be alone together and it's fine and i'm just like why would you do that like i can see i can i can definitely see why they would have some different like cultural norms versus like humans um or mundanes like i can totally understand that but why would you use that so much that you essentially take out everything that makes this a historical series like and it also it feels very sporadic too because it's not just like none of that ever matters it's like every once in a while something will happen where tessa remembers like oh yeah <laughs> i'm in the victorian period i think it's weird too because like cassandra claire obviously did a lot of research like she talks about all of like you know the books she read and the research she did and i'm like and you didn't use any of it <laughs> i don't know i i am not somebody who thinks that any historical fiction or any historical fantasy has to be like almost completely accurate or it has no value that's not what i'm saying i'm just saying like if you choose to set something in a particular time period then that should matter you know and and that's like a fun opportunity to do other things in your stories like one of the things that i love about the dark days club books is that the time period does matter um like there are there's like actually a big like climactic moment in i think the first book where um, Lady Helen, our main character, has to get to a particular place for like a meeting. They're going to do something big and the other guys who are like the guys who are in this organization are like, yeah, meet us here at like whatever time. And she's like, how am I supposed to get there? And they're like, you know, just just get there. And she's like, uh, no, I cannot be seen going by myself to this pub to like wait for you. So she has to set up all of this like this like subterfuge, you know, to get her there. Like it just makes the story feel more real. I think it gives the story higher stakes. Um, I think it's like an interesting element to incorporate. I probably said this in the introduction, but I have a theory 
about what the ending of the series is that is supposedly like so mind-blowing and everyone loves it and if it is what I think it is I'm going to be so pissed <laughs> which is honestly one of the reasons I was like I need to actually finish this series so I can just leave this to rest but anyway that's Clockwork Prince I really would like to finish this one tonight I don't think that's gonna happen maybe like within the next few days because I still need to read the third book <laughs> so um, I also should mention that I am listening to the audiobook as I read physically so that I can kind of um, keep myself on task better and there's two narrators which is not weird except that this is not like it's not like a perspective thing like it's third person and we're mostly following Tessa but we do also follow some chapters that are more like from Will's perspective and maybe some other characters but there's a female narrator and a male narrator and it's not like the woman narrator narrates Tessa and the man narrator narrates Will. Like that's not it. It just seems like completely random which sections are read by who and I just think that's incredibly bizarre and I actually I really like the male narrator. I think he's doing a good job. I think the female narrator is good like especially I like her voice she uses for Tessa and I like her general kind of narration voice. Um, I'll put their names on the screen by the way. I'm sorry I can't remember what they are now but basically all of her other character voices I find like insufferable um, especially especially Jem um, and also Charlotte's voice is weird and like even Will's voice I think is just kind of not my favorite so mixed feelings on the actual audio itself but I'm very grateful I have access to that because that is keeping me focused so I will talk to you guys when hopefully I'm done with this book Hello everybody, I'm back with what is actually going to be my last update for this vlog uh, because not only did I finish Clockwork Prince but I also read the entirety of Clockwork Princess because I started panicking <laughs> because we only had a few days left in the month and I was not done with the books and I had not realized that the third book in the series is 570 pages so I had to do a lot of reading. <laughs> Let's talk about, I have my notes here, <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare. This is the second book in the Infernal Devices trilogy and this actually ended up being my favorite of the series. You'll remember from my last uh, update that I was not having a great time with the first half of this book. Um, there were a lot of things that I was frustrated with and even though there are still a lot of things that frustrate me about this book, um, I did end up enjoying it a lot more than I thought. Um, like I, I enjoyed how many of the characters that I like that we spent more time with here. Um, I really like Magnus. I know he's like a fan favorite character so that is by no means an unpopular opinion um, but I feel like in the first book I I feel like I did like him but I wasn't like that invested in him and I feel like he ended up being one of my favorite characters. Um, also I am a gem fan so I like that we focus so much on him. Um, like I just I just really like him as a character and also the thing with Will's curse, the explanations we get are actually a little less, <laughs> um, in my opinion, like less ridiculous than they first sounded. So I, I actually ended up liking the way that went better than I thought I would um, when I was updating you last. I also thought the plot was more interesting than in book one. I still didn't love the plot but there were like more more pieces of it that I cared about than before. Oh also speaking of Jam again, um, I feel like so a couple of things that I do think Cassandra Clare is good at is like writing side characters and also writing some of the specific romantic moments or scenes and even though I didn't, <laughs> we'll get to this in a minute, but even though like I didn't buy the underlying relationship, I think the way that their chemistry was written was better. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. I really am enjoying some of the side characters and side relationships. Um, I Again, I think that's one of the things that for me Cassandra Clare is better at. Um, I don't love her main characters um, apart from Jem and even him it's like I like him. He's one of my favorites. I feel like this series really did him dirty. Also I really loved the male narrator. Um, I was actually really happy that for the third book he narrated the whole book because uh, I think he was much better than the female narrator or maybe it was their direction of like what voices for her to use because I talked about before I wasn't a fan of that. And I also think that Cassandra Clare's actual writing style is good um, in my opinion and I know some people don't like the quotes at the beginning of the chapters. I actually like them and I think it's funny because in general The Lies of Locke Lamora is absolutely considered a more serious fantasy um, than this series. Like even by people who enjoy both of them I feel like a lot of times there can be uh, a very clear difference in how people talk about and recommend these books which is kind of funny because I actually feel like the writing 
and general storytelling is more successful in the Infernal Devices than in the Lies of Locke Lamora. Now keep in mind I obviously DNF'd that book so I didn't read the whole thing. There's just so much clutter in the writing style and it's very... it's like he's showing off but there's nothing underneath it. Whereas with Cassandra Clare, her writing is much smoother and easier to read, um, but not in a way that feels to me like dumbed down. Like there are some issues I had with the writing which we'll get to later, but overall I feel like her writing actually was very good. Like it really worked for the story. I feel like she did a good job of describing like the setting and the feeling of things um, without overdoing it like Scott Lynch did. Um, and I feel like she was pretty good at, <laughs> at, at some character things. Um, I do still think that the setting could have actually mattered in the series a lot more than it did, but in terms of like setting up the setting, I think she did a lot better job. Um, which not that these books are in any way a similar story, but just reading them in the same vlog and thinking about how people talk about them, I kind of couldn't help comparing them in my head. So I don't know, that's my, I guess, slightly hot take for this video so far is I feel like this is better written than The Lies of Locke Lamora. Um, but anyway, so for the things that I didn't like for Clockwork Prince, there's, there's quite a few. Still not a fan of the love triangle. It still really isn't convincing me and not only is that just annoying in any story, but especially for this one, so much of your enjoyment and investment of the book hinges on you caring about the love triangle or at least like buying into it as being reasonable. And I still don't. I just really don't think it makes sense. And part of that is that I think the main characters are just really flat. Um, like Tessa is likable, you know, she's nice, but I don't think we get a lot of detail for her character and I don't feel like... here's the thing, is like I feel like even though I like Cassandra Clare's writing style, I feel like she will just write things that we are supposed to feel instead of like backing them up with like the character work. Um, so she'll she'll write this like beautiful sentence about how much Tessa and Jem and Will all care about each other, but then when they're interacting I don't feel like I see that. I feel like she's just telling me that. Um, and Will is also, I think, pretty flat. It's actually funny because I buddy read the first book in this series with my friend Hannah from Snow White Reader, and it was really funny because we were both sort of surprised that I preferred Jem and she preferred Will. It basically was switched from what we would expect. And then also, even though I did like the, like a lot of the plot things that happened in the second half of the book more than in the first book, I still feel like as a whole I'm not really vibing with the plot. It feels very contrived. Um, a, a lot of a lot of things about this series really feel contrived, which obviously people writing a story, like it is literally contrived because they are like building it deliberately. I just feel like with really talented authors, they don't, <laughs> like you shouldn't be stopping and thinking about how contrived a book feels, you know? Um, and that's like one of the words that I keep coming back to for this series is contrived or forced. But I did give Clockwork Prince three stars, which is the same as I gave the first book when I read that a few years ago. Um, but this feels like a higher three stars, like even though I was complaining a lot. Okay, and then for the final book in the trilogy, um, Clockwork Princess by Cassandra Clare. So I realize I haven't even been... have I summarized any of these books? I realize at the end of the vlog. <laughs> I mean, I think people... I, I, this is such a well-known series, but um, in case I didn't already summarize it, uh, basically our main character is Tessa Gray, who is an American living in, is it like mid-1800s, I think? Um, and then she ends up going to London near the beginning of the first book and finding out that she has some like strange magical powers, um, and she ends up meeting up with uh, a bunch of shadow hunters and um, trying to figure out more about like who she is and like her family. There's like mysteries about um, like what kind of abilities she has and like what kind of being she is even. And by the way, I will give spoiler warnings when I get into some spoilery, spoilery thoughts I have. Um, so anyway, this third book, there were a few things I liked. <laughs> um, so I'll start with those. As I have been saying, I liked a lot of the side characters and side relationships a lot more <laughs> than the main ones. Um, I know that some people find the pair the spare trope really frustrating where like all the side characters get matched up with each other and I totally understand why people find that annoying. I usually don't because in addition to just in general enjoying a like subtle or like side character romance, I also find that when I don't love the main characters or main romance of a story, a lot of times I can kind of find a side character romance that I like a lot more and that I'm more invested in, which can help save some of my interest in a book I'm not enjoying. 
Um, so I did enjoy some of those here. Um, I do think that Will's character got a lot more tolerable for me. His development was better than I expected. Um, there are still a lot of things about his story that frustrate me. There were some specific scenes in this book that really stand out and that I thought were really well done, and I thought some of the dialogue was, in my opinion, really good. Um, like, that kind of goes along with some certain scenes or interactions being very, um, very effective, I think. So that sounds like a reasonable amount of things that I liked, but I had so many things that I hated about this book. Um, I gave Clockwork Princess one star. Like, I truly... I'm shocked at how much people love this series finale, like, almost across the board. Um, I regularly hear this talked about as, like, the best series finale somebody has read, or one of the best, and I am... <laughs> I'm, I'm just, like, in the position of, like, feeling like I genuinely read a different series than everybody else, and it's actually making me, like, retroactively dislike the first two books more because I think there is so little payoff in this book. Um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna keep looking down on my notes because I have like so many things to say. Um, first off, this book was so boring. I did not care about the plot. It's, it felt like we were just rehashing the really boring plot from the other two books, and it also just took so long for things to happen. Um, like, this book did not need to be 570 pages. I just found it really, really slow and, again, really boring and uninteresting. Um, I also feel like a lot of things about the events or the timing of this book felt very convenient, and I am not somebody who is bothered by, like, coincidences or convenience in books. I know some people that really irritates them, which I get. Usually it doesn't bother me, like, I don't mind if you have these kinds of coincidences so that the story can happen. If I am enjoying the story, like, I will, like, I won't even stop and, like, think about how convenient something is if I'm very invested in, like, the characters and the world and the story and all of that. Um, but if I'm not, then I start paying attention to things like that more. And this one, I, this book, I feel like there was a lot of that. Um, like, the timing of... I'm not in the spoiler section yet, so I'll kind of talk around it, but, like, the timing of, like, Will going after Tessa with, like, things that happened with Jem, and then, like, the, a certain scene with, like, Will and Tessa. It just, it felt so, again, contrived. And then the, the way that, like, Will and Tessa got out of the situation they were in, I was glad it happened, but I'm still like, well, that's lucky. <laughs> um, and then the same thing with, like, one of Tessa's big moments in this book. Um, the scene itself I thought was really good, and I actually found it very satisfying, and it was cool to see her actually take such an active role in a a particular scene, like a conflict. Um, but that was another thing where I'm like, uh, okay, like that's lucky? Like how did you know to do this? Um, so yeah, there was just, there were a lot of things like that. And then also with the plot and the story, there are so many pieces of this that felt just incredibly disjointed or even nonsensical. The antagonist's plan is just so convoluted. It just felt almost silly. Like, when you, when you find out, like, the sequence of events that he, like, put in motion and how long he's been working for this and, like, what he did specifically uh, to, like, bring this about, like, it's just a little wild <laughs> and not in, like, an exciting and interesting way, in a way that's just, like, are you kidding me? And actually, that's, like, the general feeling I had for, like, most of this book is, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I... There's there's just so many things about this that I don't think worked well, and as, like, disappointing as I found this book, this is, like, I'm actually grateful that I wasn't more emotionally invested in these characters in this story, because I would have been, I think, furious. Okay, and then <laughs> another big thing that I continued to hate in this book was the main romance and the love triangle situation. I just... <sighs> I hate it so much. I don't understand why why these characters, like, why everybody is, like, so obsessed with Tessa. Like, I actually, like, I quite like her, you know? I find her, um, a pleasant main character. I find her likable. She doesn't, like, offend me or frustrate me or anything, but, like, the problem is that Cassandra Clare has these, like, beautiful, grandiose statements about romantic love that these other characters are just constantly spouting at Tessa, and it's just, it's just so over the top compared to how little development we get for Tessa. Um, and then while we're on the subject of Tessa, I, she, she was, like, such a non-entity in this book. Like, she, 
she never did anything except for maybe one or two big moments and it's like i don't want her to be just like a generic like action girl or anything that's not what i want but she just felt so passive um and even in situations like there were a lot of cases where i'm like okay yeah it makes sense that she wouldn't be able to get out of this without someone's help i just kept thinking like why would an author write her into so many of these situations you know um it, i just don't feel like it showed her off to advantage um as a as a protagonist even though i overall think that cassandra clare's writing style is fairly good like, there's a lot of parts where i feel like she is telling us how to feel about things or like telling us what we should get from a relationship or a character or a moment in the story but i do feel like i bought will and gems like deep bond more than any of the romantic aspects um so I, I feel like that one worked more for me but otherwise it's like <laughs> like i just wanted to say like repetition is not characterization you know and also the like telling us how to feel thing was not just with the romance it also happened happened a lot with specific characters like charlotte i liked actually well enough henry i found annoying um but i enjoyed charlotte and i do think that we see some of the moments of strength that we are told that we see but it just kept telling us about like the authority that charlotte had and like the natural respect all, all these people felt for her you have to show it you can't just like tell me i know that like the show and not tell is like a very like overused criticism but um this is one of the books that i feel like that really sums up my experience with another thing that was very frustrating about that is that like it actually led to inconsistencies um like there were so many times where it's like two of our love triangle characters would like have a really intensely romantic scene or moment and then like immediately after that both characters would be like thinking about how uncertain they were if the other person returned their feelings and not in a way that it's like oh they're having second thoughts maybe they maybe they were just going along with it you know but like in a way where i'm like you guys like literally just exchanged like declarations of love like what do you mean you don't know how they feel <laughs> like i mentioned already that i really feel like this series hinges on you enjoying the romance or at least at least finding the romance believable my advice if you're kind of on the fence about this trilogy is if you are not interested in the love triangle after the first book is done or at the latest by like midway through the second book honestly i would say dnf the series if you're not at least buying the concept I feel like it's going to be a really unsatisfying trilogy for you um at least it was for me also as much as i like jem more than other characters i feel like tessa's love for him kind of came out of nowhere it's like i like jem and i i, I guess i kind of wanted tessa to like jem like i couldn't understand why she wouldn't like him um but once again the intensity of it kind of came out of nowhere for me i also hated the timing of will's like big uh, conversation with Tessa. I think I have to get into spoilers now. Um, you've probably already read this series, but if you haven't and you don't want to be spoiled, I will put a timestamp down below to where you can skip the spoiler part. Um, but here we go. I, I, I said this series did Gem so dirty, and I stand by that. Like, what was this? <laughs> what a horrible ending for Gem's character. I actually found his death scene very moving and i admired cassandra clare for kind of following through on that you know because we had heard oh, so much about how like jim was dying jim wasn't gonna live very long and she actually it looked like went through with it and um i i admired her conviction for that and it also it felt pretty right for the story even though i wish there were parts of it that had been handled differently it made sense for the characters in the story and i especially really I really felt for Jem when he's talking about like he doesn't want to like he doesn't want to be immortal as like a remedy for this um like he he's afraid of that kind of loneliness and I thought that was really poignant um but then <laughs> she she takes it back so she brings Jem back which another thing to know about my reading tastes I do not hate bringing characters back who you think are dead. Um, I think it can be done very badly, but I also think it can be done well, and it's not something that on principle I hate. I know there are a lot of people who hate it on principle and they love, like, they, yeah, it's just people are very proud of the fact that they love reading character deaths and they're, like, you know, serious important readers because they like to suffer in, like, specific ways more than other re readers do or whatever. So I know there's some people who are, like, never, ever, ever bring a character back or, like, you're a terrible author. I do not feel like that but to bring Jem back like this 
enraged me <laughs> because it again like his death scene felt well done but then to bring him back like this like as a silent brother <sighs> the fact that it was in my opinion uh signposted very poorly um was just really really frustrating and also like it doesn't make sense because i think jem made a very good point and he was very convincing about not wanting to like artificially extend his life but then he does but then later he also doesn't and I, I just i just thought that was incredibly irritating and i hated the way that he kind of like came back different like i i think we are supposed to find that upsetting you know that he's not the same gem so i'm not saying that like we weren't supposed to have that reaction but that really frustrates me that that ended up being such a big part of his ending and also one of my least favorite tropes and one of the reasons i'm not usually a big fan of love triangles is i absolutely hate <laughs> when an author resolves a love triangle by like basically killing one of the characters off or like removing them from the story so definitively that the protagonist like doesn't actually have to choose um because that's what it felt like for me with Jem. i will say that i expected it to kind of go the opposite direction where like Tessa stays with Jem for a while and then he dies because we all knew he was, you know, we've been told that he's very sick and he's going to die soon. And then she gets with Will and it was actually kind of the opposite. But yeah, I I absolutely hate that way of resolving a love triangle. Um, I think it's lazy. Uh, shout out to somebody named Jade on Goodreads because I love the way they said it. Uh, the way that like the whole love triangle was handled and also the epilogue, which we will get to. Uh, yes, Jade says, total cop out to take Jem out of the equation. If CC wanted to write a series about a girl pining over two guys like it's completely normal and healthy, why not let it play out? Don't put the second guy in the freezer and thaw him when you're done with the first one. <laughs> like, exactly. I, I agree with that so much. And then the epilogue. <sighs> it felt like such a cop out. Um, and also, I'm pretty sure that we're supposed to find that epilogue really beautiful and poignant and meaningful but it kind of it had the opposite effect for me it feels like one of the many ways that this series ended up feeling like a waste of time for me um yeah so we have we have gem has been unsilent brothered now um which like i don't mind at this point i'm like at least yeah give gem some happiness please uh but tessa is immortal so we have heard about how she had this great love story with will and then he died as an old man uh and tessa is not getting any older really and then her and jem have this meeting which could have been really sweet uh i was actually i was thinking of possibly bumping up this rating to a one and a half stars because there were parts of their of their reconnection that i thought were done well but it turns out jem is like also not immortal now because he's no longer a silent brother and it's like so basically tessa's gonna suffer like this exact same way all over again and i know that that like is a thing that characters can experience and talk about in this series like magnus has talked about that like i guess we're supposed to feel like oh it is better to have loved and lost than never to love at all but i just i i don't think it had to be done like that like at this point i'm like just make gem immortal too okay like there has like there have been so many plot twists that make no sense in this book it just give me one more that actually makes the ending mean something because i guess that's the, like the problem i had is that it just felt like like it was trying to mean something and it just didn't suffice to say i did not think it was well done <laughs> uh or satisfying and also when i say satisfying i don't mean like completely happy ending everything turns out well no bad thing happens ever that's not what i mean i mean like i want the ending to feel meaningful and to not make the series feel like a waste of time and to feel right with the story and the characters and all of that um and this one did not to me so uh just like a last i mean while we're here i'm also <laughs> gonna talk about the last few like little nitpicky things um because why not and then i promise i'm done complaining about this one um number one slandering my boy sydney carton like i was already annoyed at the way that like they kept comparing will to sydney which by the way this book definitely talks about the ending of that so if you haven't yet read that one um just be aware of that i know people laugh when people act like you can spoil classics but 
I think it's kind of silly to assume that everybody has already read every classic that they want to read ever, you know? So anyway, um, but I love Sydney Carton <laughs> and I love A Tale of Two Cities. But I also didn't like how then the like ultimate conclusion everyone came to is like, no, Will's actually better than Sydney because of blah, 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 um, which I did not like because I think their reasoning didn't make sense. Um, and then also this is something that maybe in the other Shadowhunters books they talk about more because um, I've only read this trilogy. Um, but like the whole like angel things is like very confusing to me. And I know that like angels at this point are like this weird example where it's like they're also now I guess a paranormal creature in like paranormal books um, and shows and everything, but they're also like religious figures. So I was confused as to like how much of that religious element was supposed to be in here because, and this is another thing with like the contradictions, it's like we would be told like a couple different times that like, oh, shadow hunters didn't pray or like they don't have the concept of like a Christian name or something, which is what like um, English people in this time period would refer to their first names as. So we would have things like that, but it was like contradicted. It's just confusing to me because I feel like the lore of the angels and the shadow hunters in this world is very clearly based on like specific Bible stories and interpreted from those, but then also it feels like there's a lot of, it, it also feels like they're, like Cassandra Clare's trying to like distance like the story from that. It just felt very inconsistent to me. And then also I was very upset to read in like one of the last chapters that their cat had like mistletoe tied around their neck because I'm I'm like 99% sure that mistletoe is poisonous to cats. And like Cassandra Clare, I, apparently, like according to her author's note or um, her author bio, is a cat owner, so she should know that. Um, and I know that's like such a little thing to complain about, but like I did notice it <laughs> um, and I don't like that. So just be aware, mistletoe is dangerous for your cats. And it might also be for dogs, I'm not sure on that. So obviously I did not have a good time with Clockwork Princess. I gave it one star. Probably one of my least favorite series finales ever. So that's not great. But once again, like I am just so glad, so grateful that I was not like super invested, you know, in the series because if this is how angry I am when I'm not like, you know, emotionally involved, I can't even imagine how furious I would be if I had invested like emotional, <laughs> uh, like emotional uh, resources into these books. Okay, so to briefly <laughs> revisit uh, how this project went, uh, <laughs> The Lies of Loch Lamora by Scott Lynch. I DNF'd. Um, I have talked extensively already about uh, all the many issues I had with it. I thought the writing style was very overwrought and didn't really do a lot. Considering how many words there are, it didn't really do a lot. Um, I thought the characterization was fairly non-existent and I did, obviously I did DNF it, so I didn't read the whole book. But at the point I was at, I was like, we should at least have gotten like something other than like everyone standing around and talking about how amazing the male main character is. Um, also, I I just found this incredibly slow and boring. Like that prologue, I was suffering. That was like 30 pages or something. One of the longest prologues I have ever had the misfortune to read. I also personally, this is kind of goes along with like the plot and the character thing. I feel like it's a mistake to just like throw your reader into incredibly detailed dull backstory for characters without actually doing characterization and to also just throw you into like the heist plot part without making us care about the people who are doing the heist. Um, so I had a lot of issues with this. I also mentioned um, the like garnish of misogyny as I've been calling it. Um, I talked about specific examples earlier in this video but I I'm just tired of it. Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare ended up, surprise, being my favorite in the trilogy. Uh, I won't, I like literally just wrapped up these two books so I won't go into much detail. Also personally I feel like Gabriel Lightwood ended up being a very interesting character. I thought he would, like what, his first couple appearances I was like interesting and he did end up being that way. Also I still feel like Jessamine is a really really interesting character. I'm actually pretty frustrated and disappointed with the way that her story went. Then Clockwork Princess, <laughs> arguably the biggest fail of this video because I finished it, but I gave it one star. Um, I hated this book so much. Like I really, it makes me sad. <laughs> like I, I don't think it's fun to not enjoy things that other people love, you know? Like that does not bring me <laughs> enjoyment or satisfaction. And so I'm just really bummed that I I hated the end of the series so much. I don't think Cassandra Clare is an author for me. I also, like, I had heard from people that the way that the, the story resolves, like specifically the love triangle part, which is a big part of this series, that 
like it's so well done and so satisfying and one of the best they've read and it's like even if like no matter which uh character you like more for tessa that it's a beautiful ending and you'll be satisfied and i actually had like the opposite <laughs> the opposite reaction but yeah one star i hated almost everything about it but it was still better than assassin's quest and the life of traders books so you know it could have been worse <laughs> okay so i was thinking this when i was part way through the last book, the third book, um, in the Infernal Devices trilogy, I was like, well, I don't necessarily feel like I was fooled, you know? It's like, I knew these books were very well loved, but I thought, like, the whole point of the video is that, like, we're kind of worried that we won't like them, even though they're, like, very popular and they're things that maybe you, we might think we would like them. But after finishing, like, after that last chunk of Clockwork Princess, like, I honestly, <laughs> I do feel like I was fooled. I feel bamboozled because, like, I just, I just can't believe <laughs> that that is the series ending everyone talks about as being, like, so amazing. Um, I mean, obviously people have, like, diff different tastes in books. I guess I just wasn't expecting that one to be so different for me, you know? Um, and also when I say, like, I was fooled, I don't mean, like, sp people, like, deliberately misled me or anything. I just mean that, like, well, it turns out <laughs> I'm ending this project feeling like, yeah, yeah, I, I feel like I was... I was tricked a little bit, you know, unintentionally. Okay, so to end this vlog on a more positive note, I thought I would kind of wrap up by, like, reminding y'all of the books that I really love and would recommend if you want kind of a similar premise to these. So these are books that I personally feel like accomplished the premise and the story and characters and everything um, a lot better than these really hyped, well-known ones. But I think, like, yes, these would be good recommendations if you also didn't like these popular books like I did. But even if you did, like, depending on the things that you like about them, like, I also just think these are really fantastic books. So, um, in terms of a kind of heist story, um, Foundryside by Robert Jackson Bennett is another very popular one, but I really enjoyed it. And I feel like if you want a, like, plot-heavy heist story, but that you you still get some characterization from, um, I would recommend that one because as I said, um, I do feel like the beginning of that book was much more plot heavy than character heavy, but there were enough little interesting things about the characters that I was like, okay, I'm willing to see where this goes. And also, I think the magic and like the plot and all of that was so interesting that I was willing to like postpone my need to get to know the characters, you know? Also bonus, that one also has a semi-Italian-esque setting, um, which I thought was fun and and that's something that the uh, Locke Lamora books have as well. And then also I mentioned Clockwork Boys by T. Kingfisher. Um, this one is not going to be for everyone because um, it is much more character focused, like to the extent where the first book is basically all set up of like meeting the characters and just hanging out with them and getting to know them and them traveling to the city where the big plot thing and the heist is going to happen. So if that's not your thing, you probably wouldn't enjoy this one. But I really loved it. I love T. King Fisher. I think she is great at like characterization and humor and just like interesting stories. Um, and her books are just like very fun, even when they deal with some pretty heavy things. Um, and similarly, actually, Natalie and Bone by T. King Fisher also, which um, she's having a real moment on booktube right now, which makes me very happy because I have been yelling her praises for years. Um, but Natalie and Bone is one of her like well more well known titles. I really loved it. That one is not so much. I guess a little bit of a heist. It's kind of like a quest adventure heist hybrid. Um, and that one is one that like, as you're thrown into the plot, you're also kind of thrown into the characters and themes at the same time. So I think it was a lot more successful than The Lies of Locke Lamora. Um, it's also short and very feminist. So bonus. Um, then in terms of if you liked or disliked the Infernal Devices, the one I already mentioned was The Dark Days Club by Alison Goodman. That trilogy is so fantastic and I think so underhyped and I feel like there actually are quite a few similarities in the premise of these um, because it is like a similar kind of historical fantasy paranormal. I mean character is Lady Helen who um, finds out that she has these abilities, that uh, she's kind of part of this like secret group of people who are, um, who use these abilities to keep these creatures called deceivers in check, who kind of feed off of like human energy and human emotion. Um, and this is like a, a secret group that nobody knows about, of course, or that no ordinary humans don't know about. And so she kind of gets brought into this world and is trained. Um, so, you know, kind of similar to the Infernal Devices, it's also, like I said, a historical fantasy, but I think the historical parts 
actually like matter in the story and also there is an angsty romance that I think is done so much better and I feel like the brooding bad boy love interest is actually not that he's actually like a character who is very like justified and was a lot more um enjoyable and interesting as a character than Will was um and then also one I just thought of so I have another one on my actual list but then before I get to that one one that just kind of occurred to me as I was talking um is Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater this one is not as like I feel like the Dark Days Club is like the most similar in vibe and story setup um Half a Soul is not so much but if you want a historical fantasy that has again kind of a brooding love interest but for justified reasons um which arguably I think Will kind of is or is supposed to be um and also a female main character who I think is much more developed than Tessa also have a soul deals with a lot of like social themes in a way that I really enjoyed um and it's like a, a perfect balance for me of like story and romance um so if you want like a very romance focused like historical fantasy with those kinds of character types um I would definitely recommend that one and then the other one I wanted to mention is The Beautiful Ones by Sylvia Moreno Garcia this one actually also has a love triangle and it's not in the sense that like the infernal devices where all three of the people are you know like likable and they all care about each other um because one of the characters is definitely not likable but I think Sylvia Moreno Garcia does an incredible job of writing unpleasant characters in ways that are still interesting and that like don't make you hate reading their point of view you know because that's the thing is like sometimes I'm like I understand why you are the way you are but I hate being here for it <laughs> historical fantasy this one is much more like vibes only um rather than like a specific time period or setting um so that is something to, to consider as well also the love triangle and the very messy love triangle aspect um and also quite a bit of like dramatic plot things too um and there's there's only like a little bit of magic in that one but I still think it might be an interesting read-alike title and again all of these are just books I love so <laughs> um even if you're like I don't know if that exactly is like a read-alike title for this other book it might still be worth checking out because I think those books are all great okay I feel like this was a longer video than I expected considering I read only two books and DNF'd one um but please comment down below let me know if you also were disappointed in any of these very hyped books um or if you also love some of these underhyped ones I talked about um I mean Foundryside and Nettle and Bone are necessarily underhyped or the beautiful ones <laughs> but compared to the Infernal Devices and the Lies of Locke Lamora I think they kind of are um so anyway yeah let me know any thoughts on <laughs> on my thoughts on these books again like if if you love these books I'm really happy for you I was obviously hoping to enjoy them like even though I went into these you know trepidatious because the whole point was choosing books that are hyped but that we kind of had a feeling that we wouldn't enjoy um I still was hoping to be hoping to be pleasantly surprised even though that sounds funny to say um so I was genuinely going into these you know in, in good faith but don't forget to check out the playlist down below all of the people that are participating who are also linked below um even though the books were not great they were not my fave um i had a wonderful time participating again and thank you guys so much for watching i will see you soon with another video and i hope you love the next book you read bye